blessed day to everyone we praise god for we are here again to praise and worship him through singing so before we uh, sing songs of praise let us first come to him in prayer our great loving heavenly father we come to you today with humble hearts O god we ask and pray that you will um, purify us cleanse our heart O god as we Sing songs of praise as we listen to your word, O Lord. May you give us an open heart, O God. And I pray that you would really speak to us in a very wonderful way. 
Father, may you be honored, may you be glorified in our midst today. In Jesus' name, Amen. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let us sing songs joyfully to our living God.
a blessed Lord's Day to each and every one of us, and I trust that we are all doing well. The topic given to me this morning is a renewed mind. And by the way, we won't be having a PowerPoint presentation this morning, so please uh, have your Bibles with you and your uh, pen and your paper or notebook. Classic muna tayo ngayon. And our text for this morning is found in Ro- Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, a very familiar passage. Uh, we will be reading uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, but uh, we will be focusing on verse 2. Allow me to read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Shall we commit our time to the Lord? Our Almighty God, open thou our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy love. O God, would you be so gracious to us this morning as to enable us to understand, to grasp, and to receive your word. I pray that you overcome our hard and sinful hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we would be able to understand and to appreciate the truths that we are about to receive this morning and to apply them to our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul begins the second part of his epistle to the Church of Rome. So uh, scholars say that uh, Romans is the magnum opus of the Apostle Paul, and it is the closest thing that we have to a systematic theology book in the first century. And in the book of Romans, in the first 11 chapters, Paul discussed glorious truths about uh, what God has done for those who are in Christ. So he outlines how all humanity, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, are sinful and are worthy of God's condemnation for breaking the law. And he also tells us how we can be justified before God, how we can be made right before God by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he also paints a portrait of what the Christian life looks like and uh, what our relationship to the law is now that we are no longer under uh, the condemning power of the law. And uh, in here, Paul also tells us that ultimately, it is God who is sovereign over and above our salvation. So that's what we see in chapters 1 to 11. And then Paul ends uh, his doctrinal exposition by bursting out in praise. He says in Romans 11, 33 and 36, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Now, in Romans 12.1, Paul appeals to the believers to respond rightly to the mercies of God, which Paul just expounded in chapters 1 to 11. And Paul says in Romans 12.1 that the only proper response to God's mercy in Christ is the offering of the self as a living sacrifice. Paul uses the word present or offer, which in the Greek is parastesai. This word is the same word used when referring to ritual offerings. What we offer to God now are not dead animals, but by virtue of our being in Christ, we offer our living selves before Him. And our bodies, our lives, are now holy and pleasing before the Lord, not because we are holy and pleasing in ourselves, but because our works, our obedience, our lives are now perfumed by the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Paul calls, also calls this as our reasonable act of worship, logikain latreyan, which means once we truly grasp the greatness of the mercies of God, we will be driven to wholeheartedly offering our entire being to Him. What God desires is not a forced submission to Him, but a willing surrender to Him. And this is the only logical response to the mercies of God. He wants us to offer our lives to Him, not simply because we have to, but because it is our willing response to God. It is, it is our wholehearted response to who He is and to what He has done for us in Christ. Now, before we move to our main text, which is Romans 12, 2, I want to make sure that we have understood verse 1 first. And I would want to ask you two questions. The first, have we truly understood the mercies of God? Have we truly understood the mercies of God? Do we continue to ponder on the greatness of the mercy that God has shown us in Christ? Like what the song says, does God's grace still amaze us? We should be able to say, along with Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, that God's mercies are new every morning. There should be a daily, fresh recognition and appreciation of God's steadfast love and mercy. So the first question, have we truly understood the mercies of God? And the second question is, have we wholeheartedly surrendered our lives to God? Does the mercy of God compel us to offer up our entire being to Him? Are we living sacrifices? Is our li are our lives totally devoted to God to be holy and pleasing before Him? Even if we do not feel like it, the objective reality of God's mercy displayed in Christ should cause us to daily, moment by moment, surrender to God. Now, after Paul appeals to the Romans and to us who reads his uh, book, he appeals to us to offer our lives to God in light of God's mercies, and now he exhorts us to have a renewed mind. This is connected to the main verb of verse 1, which is the offering of ourselves. Offering ourselves to God means having a renewed mind. Let me read verse 2 again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, what is a renewed mind? Though it is not directly uh, defined in the text, but a survey of the entire scriptures teaches us that a renewed mind is a mind that is saturated by the Word and the Holy Spirit. Again, a renewed mind is a mind that is saturated by the Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, the mind is central to the life of a person. And usually in scripture, the mind and the heart are used interchangeably. It refers to the inner life of a person. It is where the thinking, the emotions, and the will spring from. The mind is where decisions, it is where actions come from. Our actions stem from thought processes that happen in the mind. And because we are finite and fallen men and women, we do not think, we do not feel, and we do not will rightly. Our finiteness cannot grasp the infinite perfections of our God. Our fallenness seeks to erase any notion of God. And our fallenness rebels against the perfect will of God. We desire things that are contrary to God's will. Our decisions and our actions do not, flect, do not reflect our original design. And that is that we are made in the image of God made to reflect God's character. And that is the reason why we need to have a renewed mind, a mind that is reconstructed so that we can know God, a mind that is renovated so that now we pursue the will of God for our lives. And how does God bring about this renewal? 
It is by His Word and by the work of His Holy Spirit. It is in the Holy Scriptures that God reveals Himself to us, and it is in the Bible that God reveals His will to us. We come to know who God is and what He desires from us through the Bible. And it is not only in the reading of the text of Scripture, but also in its proclamation, in its preaching. So whenever the Word of God is preached rightly, it carries the weight of being the Word of God. God uses both the reading of the Word and the preaching of the Word to bring about the renewal of the minds of His people. But merely reading and being able to mentally grasp what is written in the text is not what brings about this renewal. Simply listening to sermons does not guarantee change. It is the Holy Spirit who changes our hearts and opens our minds to the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit who enables us to truly understand the message of the Word and to apply it into our lives. In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul says that he is assured that the Thessalonians were indeed chosen by God and he said, it is because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. God's word and God's spirit go hand in hand in order to bring about the renewal of the minds of God's people. Though the spirit can work apart from the word, his work is most evident whenever he unites himself in the reading and the preaching of the word so if we are to be renewed in our minds we should not just passively wait on God to magically transformed our transform our minds in the snap of a finger rather God uses the means of his word and his spirit so there should be a constant seeking of God in his will through the word and a constant dependence, dependence on the Holy Spirit to enable us to know, to love, and to obey God. And we, do, and we do this as we prayerfully study the Scriptures and seek to live out God's will in our daily lives. So hard work is, invo in, is involved. But remember that all these, we do these things not in order to earn the love of God, but we do these things as a response, again, in verse 1, as a response to the mercies that God has shown us in Christ. So this is a response, and this is also a work of grace in us. The evidence that God's grace is working in us is when we seek to live out God's law. So we seek to obey His commands. Now, let us continue to dive into the text in order to see the characteristics of a renewed mind. So first, a renewed mind is not molded by this fallen age. A renewed mind is not molded by this fallen age. The first part of verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world. Now as a kid, I loved playing with clay. I love making various shapes and animals and whatever thing my imagination would lead me then I would probably show them to my friends. Look, oh, elephant. To which they would respond, hindi kaya elephant yan. So, I'm bad at art. Anyway, when you purchase clay sets, some of them come with pre-made clay molds. So these are usually made of plastic and they, are, they come in different shapes. So merong heart, merong circle, merong rectangle. And others are even shaped like dogs, a horse, a car, and many more. So what you have to do is you, you simply have to place the clay inside these molds and voila, the clay takes the shape of the mold. In Romans 12.2, the word conformed literally means to be molded into the schemes and patterns of this fallen world. Like clay, it means to be squeezed into the mold of this world. It is to think according to the thought patterns of this age. It is to have the world put their stamp and their, their mark of ownership upon us. The Greek word for used for this world here in verse 2 literally means this age. And in scripture and in Jewish thought, we see that there are two ages, this age 
in the age to come. This age is characterized by sin, disobedience, perversion, darkness, destruction, and judgment. And to be conformed, to be molded into this age, is to live according to the ways of this wicked world. And it is this age that Paul tells us to be wary of. We should not let this age of wickedness mold us into its fit. We are not people of this age, but we are people of the age to come. The old adage says, an idle mind is the devil's playground. So when it comes to our thought life, it is impossible to be neutral. In the Greek, the word conformed is in its passive voice, which means it is being done to us. As water passively takes the form of the bottle or the glass wherein it is poured, we are being fashioned after the mold of the world if we do not actively resist, resist it and pursue Christ-likeness. If we are just lax, the world will take over. If we do not actively desire and work towards having our minds renewed, the world will swallow us whole. It will influence our lives and take control. Our sinful nature will creep in little by little, causing us to stumble and to fall into sin. Satan will grab a hold of us inch by inch until he takes a hold of us. By being passive, we are allowing this age, the world, the flesh, and the devil to feed us its garbage. And sooner or later, we become spiritually malnourished. We begin to live like citizens of this dark and fallen age. We lose our testimony. And though after a short while of living in the world, though we desire to come back to the narrow way, things will become very difficult now. And another, the reason why we have become conformed into the ways of this world is because most probably that's where we belong. We live like the world because we belong to the world and not to Christ. Now for us Christians, it is very easy to be conformed to this world nowadays. Being a Christian is countercultural, and it invites lots of conflict. The world in its various ideologies, its cultural Marxism, the sexual revolution, secular humanism, all of that is antagonistic towards us. People of faith, particularly Christians, are labeled as oppressive, bigoted, backward thinking, and etc. And it is very tempting to just compromise. You know, it eventually gets tiresome to constantly be warring with evil. It takes so much spiritual energy to swim against the current. And our young people, most especially, are very vulnerable to this. I know, and you know, and we all have seen countless youth who grew up in church, were active in Sunday school, who eventually get devoured by the non-believing secular world once they step into college. Now, how can we prevent ourselves, our young people, your kids, from being conformed to this fallen age? By the renewing of their minds. At a young age, we should be able to teach them the basics of the Christian faith. We should teach them true piety and loving obedience to God and not just mere legalism. Now, I do not believe that young minds are not capable of learning doctrines. At such an early age, they learn co complex concepts in school. I remember in, in elementary having to memorize the different types of clouds. Now, how much more should we be serious and earnest when it comes to the study of the things of God? If we are serious in academics, then we should be serious and earnest and rigorous as well when it comes to the study of God's Word. And all that, especially at a very young age. No? We should teach them the Bible, teach them the core doctrines of the faith, teach them true loving obedience to God, especially since even right now at a very young age, our young people, our kids are already exposed to worldly thinking through media. 
Now, recently, I saw a video which showed young kids affirming same-sex relationships as if it is right, it is normal. The church should step up and equip our kids, our young people, to have renewed minds. And the same goes for the young adults, for the adults, and the elderly. We cannot be too, too complacent, right? Because we, are, we think we're old, we think we, we have spent our whole lives in church, we have spent our whole lives reading the Bible, we think that we can take the onslaught of the world. Now to those who think that they can stand, take heed lest you fall. All of us, whatever age, we should be serious about our study of the word. We should be able to take a stand against the influx of the wicked worldly thinking. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are in the midst of a culture war and Christ calls us to be faithful. We should not be conformed to this present evil age. Our thinking and our living should not reflect the world, but the Lord Jesus Christ. First, a renewed mind is not molded by this fallen age. And secondly, a renewed mind leads to transformation. A renewed mind leads to transformation. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So instead of being conformed to the patterns of this worldly age in our thinking, in our feeling, in our doing, we ought to be transformed. We should live according not to this age, but according to the age to come, which is the kingdom of God, which is already here, which was, which was brought about by the life, by the death, and the resurrection of Christ. So as citizens of the age to come, as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are no longer bound by our sinful flesh or by worldly schemes. By having our minds renewed by God's word and spirit, we are now being transformed. The Greek word used here is metamorpho from where we get the word metamorphosis. And as a kid, I was always fascinated by the, the transformation of caterpillars into butterflies. My young mind could not grasp how this ugly, crawling thing could turn into a beautiful flying butterfly, right? Because the transformation is just so radical. It's total. It's like the caterpillar has become an entirely new creature when it transforms into a lovely butterfly. And the same thing is true for believers. When we got saved, a miracle happened a greater miracle than creation itself. Yes, God created the world out of nothing, and that is great. However, it is a greater miracle when God turns a wicked sinner into a child of God. From being hell-bent to heaven-bound, from being condemned to accepted, from being enemies to children of God. This is total change. We have become new creation. This is what we call justification. We have been made right with God. We are accepted by God. However, we are not only transformed, but we are also being transformed. And this is what we call sanctification. This is the process by which we are fashioned, we are molded into the likeness of Christ preparing us for eternal life. There is now a progressive hate for sin and a love for righteousness. And this inward change that the Holy Spirit has wrought in us is made manifest in our living. The way we speak, the way we act, and the way we think, all of that has now changed. Now this transformation is not once for all, no, hindi tayo perfected agad. We are not perfected right away when we trust in Christ. So sanctification is a lifelong, grueling process of fighting sin and struggling in the path of obedience. But what is true is that there is transformation. Now transformation is the byproduct 
of having a renewed mind. And a renewed mind comes, again, from the Word and the Spirit. As Jesus said in His high priestly prayer in John 17, Sanctify them in your truth. Your Word is truth. God transforms, sanctifies us by the means of His Word, both the written Word and the proclaimed Word, which is made effectual by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, As you examine your life, are you constantly dependent on the Holy Spirit? Are your days soaked in word and prayer? As you listen to this sermon right now, is there an eagerness in you to learn more about God and to think of ways by which you could live out the truth that you you are hearing so that your lives bring glory to God? Now there are three key thoughts that I thought about regarding transformation. And I've already said this, I think, before, and I continue to repeat it because we have to be reminded again and again. So three key thoughts regarding transformation. Number one, inward transformation inevitably produces outward transformation. Inward transformation inevitably produces outward transformation. That is, if there is an inward transformation, if the Holy Spirit is working in us, then it will produce a transformation on the outside. So we cannot claim to love God. We cannot claim to know God if there is no transformation. If there is a true transformation in us wrought by the Holy Spirit, it will produce godly living. So that's, that's the first. Inward transformation inevitably produces outward transformation. The second, outward projection does not necessarily mean that there has been an inward transformation. Again, outward projection does not necessarily mean that there has been an inward transformation. So it is possible to just fake godliness. It is possible to go through the motions of the Christian life, to go to church, to read the Bible, to pray, to have various ministries. But all of that is just a show. It's possible to fake all of that without having an inward transformation. And the third, if there is no outward transformation, then there has never been an inward transformation to begin with. Again, if there is no outward transformation, then there has never been an inward transformation to begin with. If our thoughts haven't changed, if our hearts are not changed, if our actions have not changed, if the way we live is the same before we, know we, have, we knew Christ, then it's possible that you have never really known Christ at all. all right? Because true knowledge of God produces transformation. And if you examine your life, if there's no transformation, then there has never been an inward transformation. You do not know God. You do not know Christ. And the Holy Spirit does not dwell in you. And I urge you to repent and believe, to revisit the mercies of God for you, to revisit how Christ became man, lived the perfect life that you should have lived, perfectly obeyed the law, and died on the cross for your sins, for my sins, enduring the wrath of God, so that by faith in Him, You could have forgiveness and you could become children of God. That's the only way that you could have a renewed mind. Again, transformation is not instant. It is not magical. It is brought about by the means of the Word of God, by an understanding, appreciation of the truths found therein, by having our hearts and affections stirred by it, and by living it out. So this is why theology is very important in the life of the church. Theology is not just for pastors, for scholars, and for theologians, but for every believer. I remember a quote by William Ames, a Puritan, who said that theology is the study of living unto God. It's very practical. So how can we claim to know God if we do not even read and study His self-revelation in the Word? How can we love and obey God, obey the God whom we do not know? How can we live out the commands that we have not even read and studied? 
So I'm not saying that all of us should be academic theologians. Not every one of us are required to subscribe to theological journals or read systematic theology books or earn a PhD in theology. Not all are called and gifted in that regard. However, all of us are to be eager to study the Word of God, to grab whatever opportunity we have to know what the Bible teaches. May it be through reading the Bible, listening to sermons and lectures, reading books, or whatever. Because it is by seeking and meditating on the wonderful works of God that we are led towards love and obedience to Him. Again, a renewed mind, a mind that is soaked in the Word, a mind that is dependent on the Holy Spirit, leads to transformation. A renewed mind leads to transformation. And lastly, a renewed mind discerns God's will. A renewed mind discerns God's will. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, good, acceptable, and perfect are adjectives that refer to the will of God. So these are not three different things, but these words describe the same thing from different perspectives to emphasize that from all angles, the will of God is good and praiseworthy. Now, how can we discern the will of God? By having a renewed mind. Now, in the original language, the phrase, by testing that you may discern, is just one word. No? And the word is dokemazein. It is the word used for testing metals. So it means to evaluate whether something is fit for use. Now, why should we put the will of God to a test? Are we the ones to judge and find out for ourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So no, it is not dependent on us but it's dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit in us as our minds are being renewed. So the will of God here refers to God's revealed will, which is found in Scripture. According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the Word of God principally teaches what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of men. So first, by having renewed minds, we could discern and understand God's revealed will in Scripture. If left to our own fallen and sinful thinking, we simply read and intellectually grasp the message of the Bible without actually believing it and living it out. For the fallen man, this word, this Bible, is simply another piece of literature. Yes, they could understand the stories, they could study its concepts. They could draw out ethical principles from it. But the fallen man, the unbeliever, does not receive this as God's revealed will. He cannot discern that this is God's word. He will not believe it as truth, and he will not obey it as God's word. Now, when the Spirit renews our minds, he opens our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of the law of God. We are now able to discern that indeed, this is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now secondly, by having renewed minds, we are able to discern God's will in that we are able to apply the word of God in specific situations. Now there is a quote that says, knowledge is knowing what to say, wisdom is knowing when to say it. Now, more broadly, knowledge is about grasping truths, while wisdom is knowing how and when to apply these truths. When we, are, when we have renewed minds, we are enabled by God to exercise wisdom in discerning God's will in particular situations, and we are able to apply the truths that are found in Scripture into our daily lives. And the third, by having renewed minds, we can discern whether something is from God or not. Because we know God's word, we can discern whether a teaching is in accordance with the will of God or not. We know whether a decision we or others are about to make is wise or not. 
we can discern whether something is from God or not. Now, to be able to know, discern, and apply God's will, we need renewed minds. We need the Word and the Holy Spirit. The knowledge of God is necessary. If we do not prayerfully study the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should not expect to know and follow God's will. That's what happened to the people of Israel. Hosea 4, 6 said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they failed to meditate on God's law day and night, they failed to love God with all their heart, soul, and might. Because they failed to love God, they broke the covenant that God made with them. So the study of the world, the word, knowledge of God is very important in godly living. Without knowledge of God, we cannot expect to live godly lives. This is how important and central the Word of God is in the lives of God's people. If we really desire to know and to follow God's will, then we should always be in the Word. If we want to have wisdom, we must immerse ourselves in the Word. In contrast to having our minds conformed to the fallen thinking and the ways of this age, by being transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds, our thinking and our living are aligned in accordance to the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now let's recap. Again, a renewed mind is a mind that is saturated by the Word and the Holy Spirit. So that's how God renews the minds of His people. It's through the reading, the studying, and the preaching of the Word and the Holy Spirit attaches himself to the Word. That's how a renewed mind is brought about. And again, number one, a renewed mind is not molded by this fallen age. A renewed mind is not conformed to the fallen thinking of this world. But a renewed mind is a mind that is transformed. A renewed mind leads to transformation. In our thinking, in our feeling, in our doing, we are transformed. We live godly lives. We reflect the character of God. We live in a Christ-like manner. And the third, a renewed mind discerns God's will. Because we have our minds renewed by the Word and Spirit, we are able to discern what God's good and acceptable and perfect will is. In this day and age where godlessness is rampant, rampant anti-Christian rhetoric is seen and heard everywhere, and worldly living seems to be the norm. It is imperative that we, as the body of Christ, be renewed in our thinking. We must not let the ungodly patterns of this world pollute our minds and our lives. Rather, we should be salt and light. We should have our minds renewed. We should be the one who set the pace of the culture. Because this is, as the song said, this is our Father's world. We should not abandon it to the world because this belongs to our God. And it is my prayer for UEC Jensen that we would together as a church family be constantly in the Word, be dependent on the Holy Spirit so that we would be a people of renewed minds. Let us pray. Oh dear God, we are thankful and grateful for the message that we have received this morning. Lord, we acknowledge that we are sinful and pitiful people worthy of your condemnation. But we praise and thank you for the mercies that you have shown us in Christ. You have saved us by the blood of your Son, O God. And we ask that you enable us to rightly respond to your mercies by offering our entire being to you. Help us, enable us to surrender our lives to you, O oh God. And I pray that you instill in us a desire to have renewed minds, to be constantly in the word, to study your word, to be dependent on your Holy Spirit all the days of our lives, O oh God. Enable us to be strong and steadfast, to not be conformed by the wicked ways of this world, but to be transformed, to live godly lives 
to live in a Christ-like manner, O God. And enable us also to discern your will for us every day of our lives. May our lives be pleasing to you, O God. May you enable us to apply the truths that we have heard this morning into our lives. I pray for your blessings upon your people this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen and amen.